Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis for today. Before we begin with the important articles of the Hindu newspaper, once again, just a daily reminder, you can join the Baiju's Exam Prep IAS Telegram channel by clicking on the link given in the description of the video. As a part of this channel on Telegram, you will get all the latest current affairs updates for the UPSC examination. So don't forget to join this right now. Let's begin with the first article that is written on the passing away of Mikhail Gorbachev. Probably one of the most significant figures in the history of the world, the one person who has been largely responsible for bringing an end to the Cold War, that is Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev is a former Secretary General, that is the highest post in the Soviet Union era. He was the one who decided that the Soviet Union has to change its way by introducing a lot of very, very drastic policy measures. Some of his best known policies are known by the name of Glasnost and Perestroika. Now, to understand the contribution of Mikhail Gorbachev and how he impacted the entire history of the world and not just the USSR, you have to understand a bit of background about USSR. As you know, after the world wars, the world was divided into two parts. That is, one group led by the US, while the other group was led by USSR. Both these were divided on a lot of issues, but mainly the division was on the basis of ideology. While the Western world, led by the US, favoured capitalism, private capital, private property. On the other hand, USSR followed the concept of communism, that is, common ownership of land, common ownership of all the materials in the economy. Both these nations did not see eye to eye and they were opposite to each other on each and every aspect. The race for superiority in these two systems also led to the arms race, where the two nations wanted to be the first one to reach the space, wanted to be the first one to reach the moon, the first one to develop a nuclear weapon, so on and so forth. This rivalry between the two sides played out in many nations across the world. It is said that Vietnam War, the Afghan War, all these are proxy wars where actually it was US versus USSR, just that they were being fought in different parts of the world. In this setup, the entry of Mikhail Gorbachev was very, very significant. When he became the Secretary General of USSR, that is the highest post in USSR, he thought that the time has now come to change the system of the country. Understand this, USSR, because of its policy of communism, was a closed state. Closed state means they did not give any information to even their own citizens. So much so, that before he became the Secretary General, even the country's entire financial budget was unknown to the people. Like right now in India, you can just do a Google search, go on the government website and get to know how is the government budget for this year. How much money is allocated to which part of the country? However, in USSR, no person in the entire country had any access to any government documents, any government information. Also, it was strictly a government, state-run economy, where no one was even allowed to open any private shop whatsoever. This is where he said that now the economic condition of USSR is so bad, our GDP is going down, that we need drastic reforms. And this is where Mikhail Gorbachev introduced two of his most famous policy measures. These policy measures were called as Glasnost and Perestroika. Now, Glasnost and Perestroika introduced two major changes in the country. Perestroika meant restructuring. In simple terms, he allowed certain participation from the private sector as well in the economy. So some people were allowed to open a bit of shops, a bit of general stores, etc. So that the pressure on the government actually reduces. On the second hand, he also introduced a concept of glasnost. Glasnost meant openness, meaning that now the government will be more open to sharing information with the public so that the people can trust their government more. These two policies were introduced to gain the trust of the common people and to give a push to the economy. But the old timers in USSR, people who have been favoring the way that USSR works, the rich and the wealthy people who did not want the system to change, they were against Mikhail Gorbachev. That is why Mikhail Gorbachev was equally loved and hated within his own country itself. Because of him changing the policy of communism, he is a person who is said to be the reason behind the end of the Cold War. 
In fact, when the government became open to sharing information with the common people, a lot of government scams and scandals started coming out, which further increased the anger amongst the people of USSR. The people thought, at one hand, we don't even have proper food to eat. On the other hand, our politicians are making so much money. That is what started the disintegration of USSR one by one. This is the legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev. He was the one who put an end to the Cold War. He is the one under whom the USSR actually disintegrated. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev wanted to move away from communism towards a mixed economy form similar to that of India. In fact, he had favoured the Indian model and even approached Rajiv Gandhi for advice on how to adopt this model. However, people after Mikhail Gorbachev, mainly Boris Yeltsin, did not favour that idea. They thought that if we have to move away from communism, we might as well move towards the system that is followed by the US, which is considered as the Washington Consensus Model. The Washington Consensus Model means that you should have a free market economy just like the US. That is why Russia or USSR at that time suffered a lot. They moved from communism all of a sudden to capitalism. All of a sudden a lot of private property came up. A few people that were already rich started to own a lot of property and the problem in the country, that is the economic issues, only became bigger because of the existing inequality between the two sides. The Russians had thought that maybe by opening up our economy, by increasing our GDP, we would be able to improve the life standards of the people. We would be able to improve the quality of living, life expectancy, etc. But that did not happen. In fact, the author here says that in many countries across the world, you will see that even though they have a lower GDP, their life expectancy is higher. There are many nations that have a lower per capita GDP as compared to US, but they have a higher life expectancy. So Russians assumed that we will be able to improve the quality of living just by focusing on GDP, but that assumption was actually wrong. Russian economy was not suited to transition to capitalism all of a sudden. The quality of life in the Russian society also declined. And these situations, as per the author, led to the rise of a dictator mindset. The author says that conditions such as these actually led to the Russia of today, which is now being ruled by almost a dictator that is Vladimir Putin. The author says if that would not have happened, if Russia would have transitioned slowly towards a mixed economy rather than going towards a capitalist economy, thinking that free market economy will actually serve well for them, Russia would not have been in this position right now. Mikhail Gorbachev deserves a lot of credit for what he did, but the bad things that happened with Russia after him were because of the people that followed him. In fact, Mikhail Gorbachev has to be credited for bringing the world back from the brink of a nuclear war multiple times between Russia and the US. He also tried to limit the arms race between the US and USSR. However, it was his successors that did the mistake of assuming that capitalism will be good for their country. Author here also says that capitalism actually in itself is against the concept of equality. You can see it in the world politics itself. Go to any international stage, go to any international tribunal, you will see that the few rich people are always favoured against the interest of the larger population. You can see the climate change summits. Most of the developing world, most of the least developed nations want the climate change summits to take much stricter pledges. But it is a few handful rich nations that dictate everything. So the concept of capitalism always goes against the idea of democracy, goes against the idea of equality. And that is why right now, the tragedies that we are facing in the entire world are because of capitalism evolving as the most dominant ideology around the world. While the people around the world are blaming Russia for a lot of things today, including the invasion of Ukraine, but we must remember that it was because of Mikhail Gorbachev that the world was saved from a lot of wars in the era of 1990s and early 2000s. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev has been one of the most remarkable figures in the history of the entire world. As I said, he is most famously known for his policies of glasnost and perestroika, where perestroika refers to restructuring, while glasnost refers to openness. However, he also played other roles, including focusing on arms reduction and ensuring that Iron Curtain is removed. 
Iron Curtain basically means to a concept where after the two world wars, the entire Europe was divided into two parts. One which was under the influence of US, that is the Western Europe part and the Eastern Europe part which was under the influence of USSR. Even Germany was divided into two parts and the two sides were cut off from each other. This was called the Iron Curtain. This Iron Curtain was taken away because of Mikhail Gorbachev. For all his efforts, he was even awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990 to end the Cold War between the US and the USSR. He had a deep Indian connection and visited India twice in 1986 and 1988. As we discussed, he was very fond of Rajiv Gandhi and wanted to emulate the Indian model of mixed economy in his country as well. The next article that we have here is about India-Pakistan relations. The author here says that the unfortunate situation in Pakistan, that is the uncontrolled floods in Pakistan, actually present a good opportunity for the two sides to come together and improve their relationship. But most probably it will not happen. Now, you have to understand this issue from the point of view of Pakistan. Pakistan politically is going through a very turbulent times. Imran Khan was removed from his post of the Prime Minister very, very recently. And now, Pakistan is led by a large coalition government, which is led by Shehbaz Sharif. Now, ever since Pakistan has started facing this flood-like situation, countries around the world, including India also, have raised concerns over this situation. Even the Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, had tweeted that he is very saddened by the situation in Pakistan. However, the interesting part is that India has not made any open offer to help Pakistan at least so far. We see many nations around the world, Western nations, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, etc. that are raising money and offering help to Pakistan. Even the IMF has extended further $1.17 billion to Pakistan to help them. But direct help from India is still missing. This is the point of the debate here. Recently, the Pakistan finance minister said that they are thinking of importing vegetables and edible items from India. But the Prime Minister of Pakistan said that no, 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 we will not take it. We are still focused on resolving the Kashmir issue only. Now, try and understand something from Pakistan's point of view. As I said, Imran Khan now is not the Prime Minister, he is in the opposition and he is becoming more and more powerful. His party recently won the election in the Punjab province of Pakistan. And understand, for Pakistan politics, their Punjab province is by far the most important province. Because 60%, 6-0, 60 60% of entire Pakistan's population is actually just in the Punjab province. So whichever party rules over Punjab in Pakistan is a very, very important and very strong party. So Imran Khan's party recently got victory in the Punjab elections as well. Now, the problem with the sitting government is that if this coalition government accepts help from India, it gives a chance to Imran Khan, who is in the opposition, to tell the Pakistan people that, see, this government is so weak that now they are asking for help from India. Because understand this from Pakistan people's point of view. They have their own idea of nationalism. For them, if their government asks or seeks for any help from India, for them, that government will be a villain. So the present government of Pakistan, even though they might want to take help from India, even though they might need fresh vegetables and edible items from India, they can't do that under the public pressure that they are facing, under the pressure of the opposition parties that they are facing. India, on the other hand, has not openly offered any help. But the sentiment from the Indian government side is that if they ask us for any help, we will be willing to provide it to them. This is not the first time that India will be helping Pakistan in the recent past. For example, India did provide essential vaccines to Pakistan during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And we have helped Pakistan in multiple other situations. The good part between the two sides right now is that the present Prime Minister, that is Shehbaz Sharif, is seen as somewhat of a figure who favours good India-Pakistan relation. As you know, he is the brother of Nawaz Sharif. Nawaz Sharif was the Prime Minister of Pakistan when Mr. Modi paid a surprise visit to Pakistan when he landed in Lahore in 2015 and went to the house of Nawaz Sharif when a family wedding was going on. So India does have good relationship usually whenever the Sharif family is in power in Pakistan. However, this public pressure is not the first time that India and Pakistan are unable to actually come close to each other. The author gives an example of 1950s. 
in 1950 there were negotiations going on on the kashmir issue between jawaharlal nehru and mohammad ali bogra however before the negotiations could be concluded mohammad ali bogra under the public pressure of its own pakistan public and the opposition parties backed down and the issue could not be resolved because in pakistan their point of view always is that any agreement with india will only be after they get hold of entire territory of kashmir which will never happen that is why even though they need help from india in other ways they would not be willing to ask for it because they are also a democracy and at the end of the day the government has to depend on the votes of the common people which they will not get if they go and ask for help from india it really depends on which government remains in power in pakistan next year pakistan is due to have its own general elections if the present government does win the election that may be a good sign for india pakistan relations but if imran khan's party comes into power once again most of his politics is based on being anti india that is why if the government changes it might not really be a time for india pakistan relations to become better although we don't have a lot of official talks between india and pakistan but the reality is that the back channel talks between the two sides actually take place very very often back channel talks means the talks might be held on an unofficial level in a third country let's say uae saudi arabia russia turkey whichever country is willing to host the leaders will go there not ministers because they will come in the news but bureaucrats will go there or national security advisor will go they will have talks of how to resume the dialogue between the two sides these back channel talks are scheduled very very often between the two sides as i said the humanitarian aid from india to pakistan has not gone out yet we are waiting for pakistan to officially make a request but doesn't seem like they would be able to make that kind of a request The next article that we have here is on the concept of public health in India. The author here is making a point that public health in India is actually being confused with medicine. Public health means a situation where the government of India for example has to roll out vaccination programs across the country or where the government of India has to make strategies for pandemics such as a covid-19 issue. The problem in India is that we think that doctors who are trained well in their own field they would make good public health official but that is not the case there might be great doctors that are able to handle a lot of different kind of complex patients but forming policies for public health is entirely different public health requires different type of training it requires a different type of understanding of india's population it requires an understanding of those diseases that can spread far and wide but we don't really appreciate that that is why in india even the heads of public health services are usually well known doctors only even during the covid-19 pandemic we saw that rather than taking help from public health experts the government was actually taking advice from specialist doctors which might not really be an ideal situation for public health recently the central government gave guidelines that an mbbs degree is required for anyone who wants to become a public health specialist The problem with this is that you are ignoring people such as the ASHA workers, the auxiliary nurse midwives, the people who work in the anganwadis. They are the real people who are in touch with a large number of public day in and day out. They are the ones who see a lot of unhealthy people every day. Yes, they may not be trained as doctors. Yes, they don't have the MBBS degree, but they are the real public health specialist. public health specialist is not a doctor who sits in his or her chamber waiting for the patients to line up outside and sees the patient one by one no public health specialist is someone who goes beyond that and actually reaches the public within their houses make sure that the vaccination programs are rolled out makes policies for the government to actually control widespread diseases those are public health experts and in india we have mixed up the two very different fields The author says, people who work for centre and the state government are public health sector workers, but they are not doing public health. As I said, just because a doctor is sitting in the district hospital or a government hospital, doesn't mean that he or she is a public health expert, because that concept is entirely different. The author says that he uses four A's to describe a public health work: academics, so the person might be well read. activism the person should know 
what policies will help the public in the long run the person should also be knowledgeable about administration and advocacy advocacy means they should be able to suggest to the government and fight for the rights of the people in the long run now especially for public health and community health in india there are certain training programs for example there is a 3 year md in community medicine and a 2 years master program in public health while the md program is specially for doctors the other program that is a 2 years master program in public health can be undertaken by non medical personals as well who just want to work in this field this training of public health does not require you to treat specific diseases it does not require you to be a specialist of one particular organ in the human body it is mostly about understanding the greater larger population of the country which diseases can spread how how to stop the spread of certain diseases what guidelines should be issued from the side of the government for example if the government has decided that vaccination will start for a certain age group then which age group is to be targeted how they would be targeted this is the main job of public health officials and this is a specialist field and it should be kept separate from the doctors now if you look at the public health system in india i just wanted to give you a bit of information there is something about the public health system that many people don't know in india that is the government of india actually has set up a very good initiative called the integrated disease surveillance network now this was set up much before the covid-19 pandemic as the name suggests this is a network that has a responsibility to gather as much information as possible if certain diseases are spreading in some parts of the country in fact the icmr which is the apex medical research council of india actually takes a lot of data from the integrated disease surveillance network and then they undertake their research about how and where the cases are increasing what will be the testing process so on and so forth in fact the icmr has set up a large number of labs and they have increased drastically ever since the covid-19 pandemic so that if we have a situation of any community transmission of any disease we should be in a situation to ensure that we can actually test a lot of people at a very very fast pace this is how the website of integrated disease surveillance program looks like you can just google it and go to this website This was launched in 2004 so much before the pandemic it was launched by ministry of health and family welfare with the help of world bank this was continued in the 12th five year plan as well this portal is usually used for data entry viewing of reports of outbreak data analysis with respect to any major disease that is spreading in any part of the country the next article that we have here is about public education This article has been written because of a recent statement made by the Union Minister of Education in the Parliament. The minister said that people in India should not think that it is only the government's responsibility to fund the universities. Universities should look for other types of funding as well, or increase their fees and take money from the students themselves. Now, this was very odd because this idea has never really been followed in India. not just india but in most countries around the world education is usually subsidized only because if you put all the responsibility of earning money or taking money from the students themselves then we would have a situation where research and these kind of activities in the universities will actually go down and the universities will not be neutral at all this is the first time that any major minister in the country has taken this kind of a line that the government alone is not responsible for funding our universities this also goes against the national education policy of 2020 in fact the national education policy of 2020 had said that the government should promote increased access equity inclusion of a range of measures and greater opportunities for outstanding public education not just this education policy even the education policies formed before this like the 1968 policy all of them have suggested an increased expenditure from the government side on education the 1968 policy famously called as a kothari commission they had said that 6% of the gdp should be the public expenditure on education over 50 years have passed from this policy to come out we are still nowhere near this mark of 6% of gdp being spent on education in fact the 1968 committee had said out of the total expenditure on education 2% of gdp should be just on higher education but that has also not been touched 
from the center government side and the state government side. If you take the expenditure together in 2019-20, the expenditure on higher education was just 0.5% of the GDP, which is almost one fourth of what the target is. Now, the interesting part is that in the same period, when the government expenditure on education has dropped down, the government's earning has increased. Overall, the government earning, the receipt of revenue, all of that has increased at the same time when their expenditure on education has actually decreased, which is very, very odd. Higher education in India, especially if you make it privatized, that will automatically mean high fees. Now, not many people would be able to afford that. You all would be aware of the education loan crisis in the US. The US is facing such a huge education loan crisis because of the high fees that many people who are in their 50s and 60s right now, they are still paying off the education loan that they took 30, 35 years back. Such huge is the crisis of education loan in the US. Same kind of a situation may arise in India if the government backs out of funding this public education, especially at the higher education level. The other interesting part is national education policy of 2020 said that enrollment in higher education should double by 2035. Now, if you look at the composition of the Indian society, you would see that the rich people who are affluent, who can afford good education, they have 100% enrollment ratio anyway. So if you want to increase your enrollment ratio, you mean to say that you have to increase the ratio amongst the poor people, right? Because rich people are already going to college. Now, how can the poor people's enrollment ratio be increased when you are saying that the fees will also increase? This is actually opposite to each other. At a time when you are planning to increase the fees even further, how is it that you can increase the enrollment ratio because the poor people will obviously not be able to afford it. So rather than going back or rolling back the expenditure, the government should actually increase its expenditure on public education. Now I have for you some data from the side of the government of how much expenditure do we actually make in education, both at the center and at the state levels. I have also compared it with some of the other nations across the world, which are very similar in their composition economically as compared to India. If you actually see state by state basis also, India's education budget in most of the states is much, much lower as compared to the education budget as percentage of their GDP in other low or middle income nations around the world. In 2021-22 budget, the central government actually decreased its allocation for education department as compared to the previous year. Not just this, if you look at other countries around the world, you can see Vietnam, Indonesia, most of these nations have their education budget much, much higher as a percentage of their GDP as compared to India. UNESCO's 2030 framework suggests public education spending should be 4 to 6 percent of the GDP and 15 to 20 percent of the total public expenditure. Vietnam, Indonesia are all in that level. India, on the other hand, spends 14 percent of its total public expenditure on education, which is lower as compared to what UNESCO has advised to the countries around the world. Not just this, there are many misconceptions about the education budget in India. For example, education budget is not just the budget given to the Ministry of Education. In fact, some part of this education budget also goes to other ministries as well. For example, we have the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. They are also given certain budget that they spend on scholarships, on Anganwadis, etc. All that combined comes down to the education spending of the government, which is even lower. So if you look at the expenditure of only the Ministry of Education, that is even lower. So the numbers don't really tell the real story in India on how much money exactly is going into schools and education institutions at the higher education level. You can see many countries around the world where their public expenditure on education is much, much higher as compared to India. It's no wonder that nations such as Netherlands, Finland, etc. are right there at the top. The next article that we have here is written on the importance of seat belts, head restraints, etc in terms of safety for those people who are driving the car. This is written in the context of the unfortunate demise of Cyrus Mistry, former chairman of the Tata Sons, who died in a car crash near Mumbai 
while he was sitting on the rear seat the car was going at a very very high speed as per the police he was not wearing the seat belt in fact the people sitting on the back seat that is the rear seat both of them who passed away were not wearing the seat belt now most of you might not be aware but in india wearing a seat belt as per the law is compulsory even when you are sitting on the back seat we assume that it is only compulsory for the driver and the person sitting with the driver but even when you are sitting on the back seat the rear seat wearing a seat belt is actually compulsory but usually you don't really see any regulations for that if you look at the history of the seat belts you will see they were first engineered by nils ever bolin and were first incorporated into a car in 1959 although wearing seat belts is compulsory in most nations across the world even then you will see a lot of violations happening in countries all around the world in the us also in 2016 48% of the deaths in the vehicles resulted because the people were not wearing the seat belt now the idea of wearing a seat belt is very very simple as you know when the car is going at a very very high speed and the car suddenly stops because of impact of collision the inertia of your body pushes your body forward and because your head is moving forward it will only stop when it is stopped by some object that is in front of the head the steering wheel it may be the mirror it may be the windshield of the car it may be the front seat of the car that impact on the head usually results in the person losing his or her life we assume that having many airbags in the cars will actually save our life it's a general assumption that having many more airbags in the car will make the car much safer although that is true but it is not completely true even when you hit the airbags with very high impact even then you are still in very very high danger of having a grave injury so just having airbags will not really solve the situation the solution to this situation is that your head should not really strike anything at a very very high speed that can only be stopped because of the seat belt that is why the seat belts are extremely extremely important they distribute the physical force in a crash across the stronger parts of the body and that is why your head alone does not have to take all the impact the absence of seat belts can lead to the rear seat occupants colliding with the objects in the car in many cases they are at such a high speed that they actually fall out of the car through the front wind screen so the person sitting on the back seat may have such a high impact that the person may actually jump out of the front wind screen of the car and they might also fall on the road these head injuries are usually considered as the most significant and usually result in people losing their life or if not then at least breaking of the neck in india the ministry of road transport and highways recently issued a notification that the three point seat belts have to be provided in all the vehicles under the m1 category that is those vehicles which have a carrier passenger comprising of not more than eight seats in addition to the driver seat basically all the cars in fact if you remember there was a debate recently where our minister of road transport and highways she nitin gadkari had made a point that the same car manufacturer if they make a car in india that has lower number of airbags as compared to the same car manufacturer making the same model of the car in european nations just because india is a cost sensitive market to reduce the cost the number of seat bags are cut down the safety features are cut down and the government had said that now they will not accept this in the future as you can see here 70% of indians as per a survey don't wear a seat belt when they are sitting in the back seat of the car in the rear seat of the car although the law still makes it compulsory it's not just in india road accidents are a global phenomena and that is why there are multiple initiatives taken around the world to prevent road deaths there is a brasilia declaration on road safety india is a signatory to it we also have the decade of action for road safety which was adopted by the un general assembly the aim was to improve global road safety and the target was to prevent at least 50% of road accident deaths and injuries by 2030 in india we have the motor vehicle amendment act of 2019 if you remember in 2019 the government of india hiked the penalties for most of the traffic violations many folds for example jumping a red light earlier the chalan was rupees 200 now that is up to rupees 2000 in most parts of the country this is to deter the people from breaking any of the traffic rules 
We have the Carriage by Road Act of 2007 that talks about the liability and declaration of the value of goods that are being transported. We also have the Control of National Highways Act and the National Highway Authority of India Act. Most of these have provisions to ensure road safety for the people in the country. These were the important articles of the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, soft diplomacy has the potential to open the doors between India and Pakistan. Elucidate. Second, even as compared to similar sized economies, India's expenditure on education seems dismally low. Elaborate. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. You can use the link of the portal given in the description of the video. Write your answers there. You can see other people's answer as well. Evaluate them and get feedback on your answer as well to improve in the long run. Thank you so much for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.